in humanity's evolutionary heritage. And what I mean by that is that it takes a great deal of learning and experience and culture and robust expression and so forth, um, like any weak genetic tendency to become, to become manifest and functional. In this way, our need to meaningfully connect with creation has, it, has, <clears throat> has provided an adaptive function. As Keller has argued, a universal spiritual tendency in its institutional expression in religion, and Keller would also say in science, the need to meaningfully connect with creation through, through empirical inquiry and observation through, through science and religion, but he's speaking of religion here, gave form to an inherent human inclination to connect with creation. In the face of sometimes overwhelming evidence of unending diversity on earth and beyond, the spiritual insight allowed humanity to perceive and believe in an equally astonishing commonality that assumed it all, assumed it all. Despite breathtaking variability, we're even probing the secrets of a single species revealed a virtual bottomless well of detail and diversity. There appeared an equally astonishing and reassure, reassuring web of relation to seemingly united, that seemingly united a microbe in the soil, a particle of sand on the seashore, a molecule of water vapor in the air, a fish in the sea, a snake on the ground, a bird on high, even a contemporary human in the modern megapolis. This apparent unity and connection suggested an underlying order, a pattern in nature that gave shape and even meaning to our lives despite remaining but a speck of dust in the great vastness of space and time. Having evolved in close association with the natural world, then humans developed an inherent need to affiliate with the natural world, including finding meaning through deep intimacy with and identification with life. And so this idea that human happiness and fulfillment Indeed, the fullest expression of our humanity is dependent on our spiritual expression of unity, oneness, connection with nature, or, co or creation in the cosmos writ large. <clears throat> with this perspective in mind, I would like to turn to the present question from the outlook of the Christian spiritual tradition, which I realize is many and diverse. And so what I say here will remain quite general and in no way um, speak to all persons or all communities that claim Christian identity. How does the Christian spiritual tradition understand the idea that there is presently, like Father Thomas Perry says, no other way for us to educate ourselves for fulfillment and ultimate meaning than through the instruction of and contact with the natural world? And before rushing ahead to this, to this more positive or affirm, affirmative point, I do, I do want to say, along with Thomas Berry, and a question that was raised in Todd Daly's lecture yesterday, I think, Bill, you raised it, um, why, I, I don't remember exactly how you phrased it, but why, why haven't Christians cared about the environment more? What, what, why has this been the case? And, and Tom Berry, and I think it's worth noting before we go on, is that the traditional Western spiritualities have not enabled their followers to mitigate or even to understand or protest the terrifying assault of American society on the natural world. And I think this is evidence to a certain incompetence or lack of understanding or manifestation in these traditions. It might not be too much to say, following Thomas Berry still, that our spiritual traditions not only provided much of the context in which this assault became possible, but they also provided a positive, if often indirect, support for this process of assault. And so then the question becomes, are there modes of Christian spirituality that are in fact capable of enabling persons and communities to mitigate the pro or protest the terrifying assault of American society on the natural world. Put positively, and in biophilic terms, will Christian spirituality affirm and celebrate 
the notion that our deepest fulfillment depends on our connection with nature. And I'm not sure. I think there are resources deep within the religious traditions and within the Christian tradition. I think whether Christian spirituality will affirm and celebrate the notion that our deepest fulfillment depends on our connection with nature is yet to be seen. I do want to point to one tradition within the Christian spiritual tradition that I would say is a millennial tradition, or one that runs through the religious traditions and runs through Christianity historically as well. And it relates to the tradition of mysticism and Christian spirituality. On the one hand, this might seem a strange point to begin with given mysticism's penchant in certain forms for flight from the world, for a divine union that flees this earth and embodied existence, as Tad cite, cited um, the Gnostics, anti-materialist, anti-matter, anti-embodied view. It also may seem a strange place to begin since mysticism has remained far from rational theological thinking and scientific thinking of post-enlightenment theology, the theology that characterizes, I would argue, much of modern religious thought and life contemporarily. The Catholic theologian Frederick von Hugel points to three elements in all living religion, the historical institutional, which addresses itself to mind and memory, the intellectual, which is aligned with the analytical and speculative element, and the mystical, the intuitive emotional, which directs itself to the will and to the action of love. All three of these elements need to be stressed in religious life. The intuitive emotional orientation, the mystical aspect of religion, not to thank God, but the love for God, the madness of love that animates the mystics, the deep experience of the numinous elements of the universe within the earth itself, within our own selves, is an aspect of Christian spirituality that has been marginalized in 20th century spiritual, in the 20th century spiritual tradition. Though I think it is one that has great potential in affirming and celebrating our inherent need, humanity's inherent need, to live meaningfully in relation to connection. And I would say that it, the mystical germ or the yearning, the mystical yearning with William James, I would say is a very common germ. I think it is one that is inherent to um, what it means to be human. In the first place, what is rarely left behind in mysticism, says Larry Rasmussen, is nature. Nature abounds in the mystic's experience and holds unchallenged rank in most mystical visions. Nature and mystical experience is often the ground, place, or interlocutor of knowing and experiencing the love of the divine and the love of nature, of the shedding of the ego and de- and recentering of the self in order for it to flower into its fullest being. The deepest expression of one's humanity in this sense is known, bound by the natural world. I have had no other masters than the beeches and the oaks, writes Bernard of Clairvaux. The night became very dark, writes 20th century Roman Catholic monk Thomas Merton. The rain sounded the whole cabin with its virginal myth, a whole world of meaning, of secrecy, of silence, of rumor. Think of it all, all that speech pouring down, selling nothing, <coughs> judging nobody, drenching the thick mulch of dead leaves, soaking the trees, filling the gullies and crannies of the wood with water, washing out to places where men have stripped the hillside. What a thing it is to sit absolutely alone in the forest at night, cherished by this wonderful, unintelligible, perfectly innocent speech, the most comforting speech in the world, the talk that rain makes by itself. <laughs> 